Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is John Olegas. John is the co-author of a book called Getting Started in Employee Stock Options, and uh, that's published by Wiley. He also writes an email newsletter called Truth in Options. And I also have a book about stock options. It's more uh, tax oriented. It's called Secrets of Tax Planning for Employee Stock Options, 2009 edition. And hopefully I'll be getting another edition out by early next year. Um, so as far as John's background, he uh, is the owner of a company called uh, Truth and Options. He was formerly a member of the Pacific Stock and Options Exchange and the Chicago Board Options Exchange. He co-founded Options Research, which was the first analytical service to provide theoretical option values to market makers and the general public. For years, he was considered one of the leading options market makers in the world, having created many of the trading and hedging strategies that are used today. And in his younger days, John was a pitcher in minor league baseball, including the Reno Silver Sox. You know, I traded uh, outlines here. But you were telling me before, let's see here, oh, that a roommate of yours was Ray, Ray Fossey. Ray Fossey, yeah, who's okay. the announcer for the Oakland Athletics now. Yeah, so anyway, uh, that's kind of an interesting little piece of information. And his first minor league game against the San Jose Bees here in San Jose. Now we have the San Jose Giants as our minor league team. Back then it yeah, was the they bees. Changed it a while ago. Right. Uh, John, thank you for joining me here today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Michael. Uh, I'm glad to be here like I was the last time, and I'm sure we'll have an interesting conversation if you don't ask me too <laughs> difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll help each other along here. Um, today, John and I are talking about some of the basics related to employee stock options. And before we get started, I want to just caution our viewers that this is just an introduction to a complex topic. I do that quite a bit on this show. And so uh, you should seek advice from a tax advisor and probably an investment advisor. And as you'll see from some of the discussion John and I have, uh, it's a good idea if you can talk to somebody that really understands options hedging strategies. So with that, we'll just get started. All right, Michael. Okay. Well, John, why did you get involved in advising people with employee stock options? All right. As you said, I was a market maker for trading options on the Pacific Stock Exchange and then on the CBOE. And part of the strategy involved hedging, that is uh, trying to reduce the risk of holding either other options or stock. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, I guess several years ago, I noticed that this whole arena of employee stock options and other types of equity compensation really did not address risk reduction because mm -hmm. those employees ended up by holding large positions in concentrated stocks. Right. And I thought, and I still do, that the best way to manage those things is to do some of the strategies we use as options market makers trading exchange uh, traded options on these uh, various floors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, to me, the industry does not well serve the grantees who receive those options as far as how to best manage them to reduce risk and get the most out. Okay. And so that's why I got into this. And uh, it took a quite a bit of study in a whole new arena. Mm -hmm. But there's very few people that are in that arena that have experience as market makers. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, most of them aren't involved in uh, uh, trading options, you know, at all. I mean, it's sort of a specialized area of investment anyway. And um, so, you know, most of the people that are advising for investments, you know, have some sort of a financial planning background. And the tax people like myself, you know, well, mostly we know information related to how the tax system works but not necessarily are well versed in some of these risk management strategies so um, that's part of the reason for having you as a guest <laughs> all right okay. well thank you Mike okay so why don't you explain what an employee stock option is an employee stock option is a contract between the employer 
and the grantee, and it's usually an employee, whereby the employer assumes an a liability towards the grantee, of the employee, and that is to deliver shares to that grantee at a specific price over a specific period of time. And the employee has the right to buy those shares from the employer throughout that period of time at a specific price, mm -hmm. okay? There are restrictions mm -hmm. as far as when he can make that exercise mm -hmm. because he has to, the options have to vest into him before he can exercise. Right. And then uh, there are some other restrictions whereby he can't sell those options and he can't pledge them as collateral for a loan mm -hmm. or he can't deposit them into a margin account, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, the exactly what he can do and the terms of the contract are within certain documents that the employer and the employee enter into. Mainly they're called uh, the plan document uh, or the stock plan document or the, or they call, call them various things. But it's a document that applies to all grants for all employees. And then there's a, a specific document called a uh, grant agreement, which has the specific terms of the particular grant at a particular time mm -hmm. between the employer and the employee. Right, okay. And usually the term of these options, and it varies a little bit. I mean, these term, one thing people need to understand is the tax law uh, has some impact. It sort of makes a parameters within an agreement can happen, but each agreement can vary in the specifics. So for example, instead of stock options, they say that the uh, grant period can't exceed 10 years. That's sort of been extended over to non-qualified stock options, but it's not a requirement and, and so forth. So anyway, in other words, it's like the field within which uh, the uh, employer then can make a definition in the employee in, in, uh, right. as far as how the option works. Right. Most of the uh, options that are granted, whether they're incentive stock options or non-qualified employee stock options, they have a 10-year life. In mm -hmm. other words, if you're granted the option at uh, year 2005, they expire perhaps 2015, mm -hmm. okay? However, uh, you can't exercise until you vest, and a lot of times it's anticipated that the uh, employee is not gonna stay there for the full 10 years or he's gonna exercise sooner. Mm -hmm. you know? So the 10 years is a maximum contractual life. Mm -hmm. and very few hold them all the way to the end, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, so there, there are similarities between these employee stock options that are granted by the company to exchange traded options, mm -hmm. okay? And some people may have become familiar with exchange traded options. Uh, for example, you could buy calls or mm -hmm. you could buy puts on Apple. Yes. And a lot of people doing, doing that. But they have similarities to mm -hmm. the employee stock options, but mm -hmm. there are major differences. Right. Okay. Okay. So we'll get into some of the actual probably we're going to highlight those differences really in another program. You and I are going to talk about hedging strategies. So right now I want to sort of define a little bit of, you know, just what these things are and, and how they work. Again, covering sort of the basics. So what are the basic types of employee stock options and do the best you can here and then I'll help you out if you need some help. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there are the non-qualified employee stock options, which is the standard type, uh -huh. and it applies uh, to the, the big time executives. Yes. They all get non-qualified employee stock options because the, the incentive stock options, they have tax treatments that are different and they have terms that are different, yes. okay? So the incentive uh, stock options just apply to grants to the employees, Right. okay? Non-qualified employee stock options can be granted to suppliers mm -hmm. or attorneys or I, I was discussing uh, with uh, a guy who was an uh, uh, had a service where he found jobs for, for major uh, like a headhunter yeah and he got employee stock options mm -hmm. in the big heyday of the, uh, the, the yeah. 1999s and things like that he made a lot of money himself sure. but those are non-qualified employee stock options right the, the uh, Qualified employee stock options 
you have to hold them at least two years before the time of grant, and you have to uh, hold the stock uh, at least one year after you exercise them. Yes. Uh, so it's actually it's more than, so more than two years after grant, more than one year after exercise, yes. R right, and those are the incentive stock options. And the, if you, in fact, they're, if they're in, they are in fact granted and in a qualified way, and you act to keep that qualification, the gain will be long-term capital gain, right. as opposed to the non-qualified employee stock options. Whatever profits or gain or, or, or return they make is going to be ordinary income subject to compensation income and with, uh, withholding and, uh, and Social Security, Medicare, okay. and, and okay. all of that. So, so we'll, we'll get into some details in that in a moment. So um, anyway, but yes, incentive stock options, and also let's talk about employee stock purchase plans for a moment. Right. So you know more about that. Okay, than so, I do. so, so, so I'll, I'll talk about it for a moment. Uh, incentive stock options, uh, basically, you can sort of discriminate with. You can give them to whoever you want to. There's also something called an employee stock purchase plan. It enables employees to buy uh, the employer's stock at a small discount, about 15%. Um, it's also considered to be a qualified stock option. There are incentive stock options and employee stock purchase plans are both qualified options. They are called qualified because they qualify for special tax treatment, as you said, instead of having some of the gain taxed as ordinary income when the option is exercised, it is treated as uh, long-term capital gain if you meet the holding period requirements. And there is no uh, tax consequence other than for alternative minimum tax that we'll talk about in a little bit uh, when you exercise a qualified mm -hmm. option, whereas for the non-qualified there is. So, okay. Uh, now, I'll mention to our, our viewers again, uh, our discussion here is going to focus mostly on non-qualified options and incentive stock options because this, re this is where the big money is. It's, uh, yeah, represents that's where most of the value is. That's where most of the value is. So that's why we're going to mostly talk about those, not so much about employee stock purchase plans. If we have some time along the way, uh, depending on how things go, maybe I'll talk a little bit more in detail on those. All right, so we talked a little bit about some characteristics of non-qualified stock options. So just to summarize, you said uh, it's the only one that you can give to a person who's not an employee. That's right. And so.